door. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. We are excited to have a fantastic guest on our show today. Um, he's got quite an incredible story. Uh, there's an incredible story of how something that you would think if this happened to you, you'd be like, wow, this is like the worst thing in my life, the worst moment in my life, the worst thing that could ever happen. And that's probably true. I think in some levels, you'll probably hear quite a bit about how that was not a good thing in some ways. But also, this guy is telling us that this is the best thing that's ever happened to him. So how do you go from something that is horrific, like a car accident that where you break your neck, into something like this has brought me or has given me the happiness in my life that I was always looking for. So we're going to talk with an incredible guest today. His name is Pavel. He's got a book out. He's got a Netflix documentary coming out. I'm getting emotional just thinking about it because I'm excited to hear your story. So welcome to the show, Pavel. Introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you so much for having me aboard. Um, I'm happy to be here to, to share bits and pieces of my story. Um, my name is Pavel, and as, as you said, I was in a, in a terrible car accident, but not that's not what makes it special per se. It was both me and my wife were in that car accident, and she broke her neck, and I broke my neck. Um, she was given 10% chance to survive her accident or the first night in the hospital. Um, my, my, my neck break was actually so bad that it didn't know what to do with me. My neck was basically balancing on a string, so I broke the C1, which controls the breathing, and all the ligaments were torn and the skull was broken. So um, I was like a bobblehead. Bop, 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 bop. Um, so I had to lay still in the, in the hospital for three days and three nights. Like, just still, they just didn't know what to do with me. Um, so the backstory is that um, I was a successful photographer in America, um, maybe the most successful fitness photographer at the time. My wife, Kat, was a major in the U.S. Air Force. We were both just at the pinnacle of our careers and, you know, everything. Um, Everything should have been happy and glory, but it really wasn't. We were both kind of looking for love, if you want. Um, I had everything. I had the Range Rover. I had the Rolex. I had a million dollar in the bank. And so did, so did she. She had everything. But we were lonely, both of us. Um, and a long story short, we met at a fitness party. And after that, it was just explosions. You know, we It was a perfect we, fit, you might say. <laughs> perfect fit, yeah. Couldn't, couldn't have been better. Couldn't have been better. Um, so we traded that loneliness from our childhood to just embracing. And it was, it wasn't even that, um, I'm going deep here, but it wasn't even that sexual. We were just looking for comfort and, 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 and safety net. We were looking for safety mostly. So we, we spent days and days just laying and hugging each other in our arms. So with that in mind, after being married only one year, um, and we were going to celebrate our first Christmas together, we went into our Range Rover up on the 405, which is in infamous highway in Los Angeles. Um, and before I could even react, something shook the car said, and the car started sliding. Um, it was started sliding off the road, off the road. Dust came up. I was holding the steering wheel really, really hard. And we hit one of those big street signs that says Newport beach or Laguna beach. And, um, uh, my head went boom in the windshield. And that that's when I cracked and broke my neck. And we rolled four or five times. And when I woke up, it was just blood, chaos, and glass and chatter. So that's the backstory to it. Wow. So how did, I mean, tell us a little bit more. Like, how did you get from there, this accident, to the hospital? How did, how did, how did you get out of it? I mean, did they have to use, like, the jaws of death? I mean, jaws of life. Yeah. Jaws of life, I guess. Yeah. Sorry. We're so focused on death. Yeah. <laughs> We're at the beginning of the evolution of the story. The death is the beginning. The life comes at the end. Yeah. Um, so um, my wife being a major in the Air Force, she thought she had broken her arms because she couldn't move her arms, but she had broken her neck instantly on impact. Mm -hmm. But she kept her cool. And she's, um, she said, Pavel, go and get help. So the car was upside down. I rolled out of the car. I landed with my head first. I should have died right there. But I was so... Um, I was so combobulated in my head due to the trauma that I I, just, I couldn't even remember how an, how a phone looked like. So I'm screaming to Kat, I can't find it. I don't know how to look like, what to do. And she was just ice cold calm. She said, Pavel, go and get help. So after a while, I walked, I walked out on the 405 
and you can walk your neck is broken and you can still yeah. walk wow, yes that's... yeah yeah so um, it's piss and blood everywhere wow it's it's throbbing but it's there's no pain Aaron that's it's and many people ask me about that it's not it's not painful in that sense but you feel like you're gonna die you know you're about to die but there's no pain I wave my hands, no cars are stopping. So at that point, at that point in time, I take the decision that I'm ready to die for my wife. So I walk out onto the 405 and that's six lanes of just heavy traffic. And I'm waving my hands, no car stopping. Wow. And, and I'm getting goosebumps. No one stops. I don't know if you heard about the phenomena, the, um, the third person or the third, they, whatever they call it, but in front of me, a person appears with like um, dressed in rags, that like rag doll, and he's asking me if I want help. And I scream at him, "Call nine one one! Call nine one one!" I still today don't know if that was a vagabond, if that was an angel, or if that was my alter ego. But nine one one did, you know, the ambulance did show up after that. So, wow! And then at that point, I mean, I don't know how far we want to move into the future, but at that point, you, you somebody they show up and they take you. I guess I'm wondering on the big picture like what the whole recovery process is i'm just very mindful of of where we're going here and on the other hand i'm super interested in every single second right right <laughs> so oh, go ahead Amy. yeah so i mean that's a great question like when did you know that your neck was broken what what was what did they tell you was the recovery process and then what maybe what actually happened you know because sometimes yeah. they'll say like this is what's going on and you're like no that's not going to happen i'm going to walk again or whatever yeah, I had I had the utmost fortune to meet the toughest, most grittiest uh, doctor there is in Long Beach Memorial Hospital. I I was wheeled into the trauma room. Uh, at that point, I was I was hurt. I was in pain. Um, at that point, the adrenaline had worn off. Um, I was laying straight down, and this head comes like over me like this, and this is this um, dark skinned woman with this these intense brown eyes. It's a small little figure. But she looks straight at me and she says, your wife is going to be paralyzed for life. Your wife is going to be paralyzed for life. And at that point, I had like a millisecond. I, and, you know, literally, okay, either I'm going crazy. I'm just going to go crazy, like mentally off the charts. Or I'm going to do something else. And I chose to just like start repeating I'm going to be strong for cat. I have to be strong for cat. I have to be strong for cat. And I did that three days and three nights. I never. Stopped. I love that you said that because because it's a very clear choice that you're making. And I've I've talked with other people. Like I have a, a good friend that had a was in a skiing accident yep. when he was uh, 16. Um, and Brian tells me like, yeah, there was this time where doctors had said, you know, you're not going to walk again. And it's like yep. you have a choice of how you respond to this. Um, and that choice has really determined this path for your life. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right, Aaron. It, it is, it is a choice. I don't, yeah, yes, it absolutely is a choice. I don't know how I took it, you mm -hmm. know, subconsciously or what I really happened, but I made the choice and I made a choice to be strong for her, which made me maybe not dwell in my own misery. Like, cause, cause I had, I was actually worse off than Kat, but that was before they actually fixed fixed me with with a with a halo that they screwed into my skull. Wow! Um, but it allowed me to not think about myself, but just to, to like mount the warriors inside me and just be strong, be strong, be strong. And I thought that for three days and three nights. And after that, it's just kind of kind of rolled on. So yes, yeah, yeah, it's a choice. Yeah. Did did that doctor say anything else to you besides uh, the stuff about cat? I'm just wondering. Dr. Farron, yeah. Dr. Farron, uh, yeah, she says she told me to be strong. So maybe that's where I got it from. Mm. I don't remember it like that, but maybe she did. And then if she did, that's fantastic. And uh, Dr. Farron and I are now very close friends. We we shared um, quite of a quite a journey over the years. So, yeah. I I, I mean, I thank her. She's a, the, one of the main characters in the movie. And I thank her for her honesty. She had the guts to be honest. Yeah. Like, and she's from Iran. I don't know if the Ara Arabic culture, but they're very direct in the Arabic culture. Mm -hmm. And maybe that that's what, you know, she brought with her. Um, but that directness and looking in my eyes and just telling it how it was. Like, don't sugarcoat it. This is how it is. Deal with it. Deal with it. And that at least it helped me. So 
Yeah. yeah, no, I love that because it it told you this is what is actually happening and yeah. here's what it's going to require of you. And and you've got a choice, you know, this is the reality of the situation. Yeah. And if you want to, yeah, like you said, it it made it clear that you've got a, this, this path in front of you to go left or to go right. And she was encouraging you also in a very, seems like a very loving way, just a very direct way, be strong, yeah. choose strength. So yeah. what was what was that recovery process like for you? And did you have people in your life that were like supporting you that came around you? Because, um, you know, when people go through stuff, I think a lot of people um, have difficulty with the reactions. They don't know how to react to, to somebody uh, like that. So what was your process like? One second, Pavel. One thing I want to highlight that you were just talking about, Aaron, yeah. is, is what people can make a choice based in truth. Mm -hmm. And it's crucial that you hear the truth. And this is what we've talked about a lot on the podcast is that part of being in therapy is realizing that your therapist is going, to, is telling you the truth. Like this doctor. Like the doctor right. did. I mean, if if the doctor gave you some like, okay, we'll make sure you're strong. It's going to, you know, it's all going to be <laughs> fine. I mean, it's a totally different choice yeah. that you have at that point. Um, Cause you're just, you might relax. You might not fight that much because it's going to be fine anyway. And right. you probably don't know the the reality or the gravity of the choice that you're making because it's not really grounded in the full truth. Your your reality was grounded in okay, my wife's going to be paralyzed for the rest of her life. Like right. I need to let that sink in and and go with that. Right. Yeah. Now you you guys you guys are therapists, right? That's what you do for a mm -hmm. living. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. The truth. Um, it's it, it. While the truth helped me, the truth did not help the ones that were supposed to help us. Um. So that first week in the hospital, my world really collapsed uh, in a sense that I realized that life is arbitrary for the first thing in that the universe did not stop because we had an accident. And you, you, you think so. You think it will. You're like, stop. Let's fix this. Then we can move on. But everything just kept on rolling on. Um, but so that was one shock. The second shock was that the people that I thought was going to be there for us were not there for us. So in the long run, none of our families were there for us, they, uh, which, which really shook me to my core more than the accident, I want to say, because I was born and raised with the illusion, I want to say, that the family is family's blood, family is there for you. You can always turn to them. And me being a successful photographer, I always took my family on big expensive trips and yada, yada, yada. And obviously, I thought they would be there for me, but they weren't. They chose... They chose to come with excuses and and back off. Um, and for me, that was worse than the accident. I did because I, I didn't know what to do. It's like you, you, you're all alone. Like you're literally all alone. Um, so that was tough. But in that loneliness, there was a blessing in my screams on Facebook. Thank God for social media in that sense, because I really screamed it out. I was desperate. I was at home home. I still had a broken neck. My wife was about a broken neck. She was suicidal. I had no one. I had subpar caregivers now and then coming to help me. So I just, I screamed out on Facebook and text and video and, and audio and, and people heard me. They, you know, people I didn't know, people we didn't know that had experienced similar pain came and helped or messaged me and asked, can I come by? Can I, can I help? What can I do? And they're now some of our best friends and, and, um, uh, it's remarkable people. It's remarkable people. And and I have some of them in my documentary, obviously, and just warriors, just overall warriors. When when did you realize that your close people, your family and that kind of thing were actually not going to help? I mean, when did it settle in? It settled in once we came home from the hospital. Once we were released from the VA, um, three months after the accident, everyone thinks you're okay. That's when the shit starts. Like, because when in the hospital, really, you have 24-7 help. If you need anything, you just ding the bell and someone will come in and help you. That's not the problem. When you come home, you, you're, you're like a shell. I was a like shell. Like people forget about time. you almost. Yeah. They think you're okay. They're home. They're okay. And we had no one. It was just me. I was just, you know, I was a shell of myself. Cat was suicidal. And I had no one. I had some subpar caregivers from an agency that I didn't care. And it was just like, you know, it's just, you walk through like fire and brimstone, like every, every second of every day, literally. And so I'm, I'm, well, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, go for I, it. But I, I imagine that 
you've reached out now, you're reaching out on social media, that kind of thing. And then these people that are supposed to be caring about you the most are not responding. I mean, you've got other than maybe, as you mentioned in our previous communication before we started the show, the idea that they're giving you money or whatever. Um, other than that, you know, you're only really hearing from these folks that you uh, that were surprised to even hear from at all because you did not know them. Yeah, I was, I mean, I was so desperate. I asked my mom, all you have to do is come over and help me wash the dishes. That was the level of my desperation. And she was like, no, no, I'm, I'm too old. And lots of other excuses. And hearing that from your mom, it just, you know, it broke my heart like a million pieces. And then I asked my, my best friend, I don't want to say his name, let's call him Ralph. And he's a multimillionaire. And I said, Ralph, just, just, just te text me every morning. Just to make sure I'm okay. And just Keep me accountable. Just text me. Just say hi. And he couldn't do that. It was just too much for him, I guess, because it reminded me or him of, of my life, of the sadness. So it became very clear very fast that people, they have they have so much going on in their own lives, I think, that they, they just can't handle any more sadness. But the ones that did, the ones that came to help us, they, they fed from the responsibility and became strong. But it takes a level of, it takes a level of, of humanity to do it, you know, like mensch, you have to like embrace your humanity to do it. And most people in today's day and age don't, I guess. So. Yeah, I want to I want to come back to the sadness piece, because um, we had, had touched on that before we started recording. I think that's there's some really powerful stuff there. But one thing that people will, uh, will say a lot in my office that they're going through something, especially with stuff like grief or, you know, uh, like an accident, um, I had some people go through things like that. They will often say that family members, friends won't contact them. They won't reach out. They won't say things. And, and to the therapist, me, they'll say, I think it's because they don't know what to say. And it's maddening because you're here all alone and you're desperate crying out. You're like, I don't care what you say. Right say anything, say nothing. Like, do you have any advice for people that are um, the family members, the friends of maybe listeners in our audience that know somebody who's going through something like what can they say or do that would be meaningful when they don't know what to say or do? Yeah, in, in all honesty, the most meaningful thing you can do when you're trying to help someone in pain is just being there. Don't, don't even, I would say don't say anything. Don't try to say anything. Don't try to be, and don't be pragmatic. Don't try to solve the problem for God's sake, because you can't. Not right there and then, that's for sure. Just be there. Show up. Just sit there. And if you're going to say something, you say, I don't know what to say, but I'm here. And that's honest. And, and, and what you need when you've gone through trauma, at least the kind of trauma that we went through, is just honesty. Mm -hmm. You just, because you, you, you're, don't sugarcoat me. Like I, I was near death. My wife is near death. We, she's suicidal. Like, we, like we haven't, like we need it straight. That's what we yeah. need to survive. So, so just show up. I know, I know people will ask this and it seems really basic, but like, what, what good does it do to just be there? Like, I'm not doing anything. Like, why is that so important? Good question. It gives safety. You feel safe. Honestly, that's, that's it. You just, you feel like someone cares and it gives you safety. It's, I guess it goes back to being in mommy's tummy or something, but <laughs> it just makes you feel cared for, you know, and it's love, right? Isn't that what we're all looking for in some, some way, shape or form? It's love, right? If it's, it can be sex, it can be someone holding you. It can be caring for your older mother. It can be caring for your daughter, but it's all love. Right. And that's, I, I would, yeah. Categorize it as love. Yeah. That's beautiful. I really ultimately, um, I think you're right because what you're, if you really look at the truth, the reality of the situation, you were alone, you had nobody. And all these people, like you were saying, their lives are so busy. They were investing their time, the giving themselves to all these other things that they're doing, maybe other people. But what you needed was them to sacrifice that and to give them, uh, to for them to give of themselves and of their time to you. And that is like the greatest gift that we have is ourselves mm -hmm. and our time. And so if I can give that to you, just being with you yeah. is one of the most incredible gifts. And I think this is why when people are dying, they want their family around them. Like, you don't need to say or do anything. Just okay. being with me gives me the sense of safety and comfort that I need to be at peace. Yeah. And where do you want to die, Aaron? At home. You want to die at home. Never in the hospital. Trust me. Like, it's the first thing ever. I, I was the same way. Like, don't, don't let me die here. I want to go home. Cat, mm. I mean, Cat and I live so 
and I'm sorry for putting a bit down on your fantastic program. That's usually very happy. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's okay. But Kat and I live very close to that. <laughs> yeah. So um, just the other day, just actually yesterday, Kat um, collapsed a little bit. So Kath and I are so familiar with death and we're, we're okay with it. Um, but we both agree that we want to, we want to die at home or it's more about her and she wants to die at home. So for, for God's sake, don't take me to a cold hospital where you can't come visit because they have COVID routines and you know, all that. So it's, it's home. Like you want to feel safe. It's that safety thing again. It just comes back to it. Yeah. It's interesting because it's what it's like the process you, part of what you went through was you're alone, right? So you are alone, but then there's the realization as you reach out that you are alone like okay well you are going to be alone now that's yeah. a different situation i thought i i knew i didn't have anybody around here but i didn't actually think i was actually alone until now and then You're so, smart. So, yeah. so so really what's happening it um that people actually are solving a problem when they come mm. to you they're solving the problem yeah. of you being alone and that's it um and i think of in our connection as people at the end of the day your millionaire friend, for example, that couldn't text you in the morning or whatever, I think, is he actually present in any of the relationships that he's in? You know, it, it kind of challenges the idea that if if you're a lot of humanity is just simply actually being with the person. And I think a lot of times you just get into a lot of routine. Yeah. And were you actually uh, present with the family members that you were spending time with, you know, that you were taking them on these trips before. I mean, that kind of was like the question of like, who was really present? Yeah, no, you guys are very smart. That's, that's brilliant. I love the way you phrased it that, um, well, the question about my millionaire friend, if he's, if he's ever present, and I think he's not. And, um, and the question and, or the, the statement that, um, you yeah, you think you have people around you and then you find out you're not, so to speak. And you're right, Aaron. I like it. I've through really, I've gone through this journey, right? Like this examining how how was I before the accident? Like, you know, and, and there's there's certainly um an introspective journey to be made. And and I but it um I could have done more, let's put it this way. And now I do more. So mm -hmm. for me, I usually say that take away cat from the equation. The accident has been bliss for me. It's been the greatest gift of my life. Before the accident, I was I was afraid of dying. I was afraid of the universe. Uh, you know, like you know, I had all these all these material things, but I was I guess I was afraid of losing them. But after the accident, the values, my inner values, uh, are the ones that I I I cherish and I cherish the people around me. And now my first thought is, how can I make their lives better? Like, how can I help someone else? Mm -hmm. And it's it's part ego because it makes me feel better to help them. But it's a good ego. It's a good circle of good, circle of good. Um, I think this is one of those things that, you know, we were talking before uh, we recorded, you know, about the the whole sadness thing. And, you know, I just, I really appreciate your sensitivity, you know, and, and a little bit of humor of like, <laughs> I don't want to bring your show down. <laughs> and you don't at all. I mean, because that's ultimately really like, like you're saying that life that the greatest joy also has to come with the depth of pain. You cannot have one without the other, right? Right. Um, if you get lost in the depths of pain and can come out of it, you can now experience the greatest joy because you know what it's like to be in that spot of, of dire need. And so I'm just thinking for the listeners out there, you know, again, these people that maybe are not helpful or they don't know what to do, or, or maybe even they're like looking at it like, oh, well, what do you want to do on Saturday? Well, we could visit Pavel or we could go <laughs> golfing, right? In the sun, right? It's like, yeah, <laughs> right. there we go. let's go sit to next to a person in near death or hit a golf ball, <laughs> right? And drink a beer. That sounds happy yeah. versus, you know, something that's sad and depressing so like you, like what, what what would you have to say for people who might be afraid of or maybe um a little bit hesitant around you know going and visiting somebody being around somebody who's sad or depressed i would say i would say try it and see what it does for your self-esteem and the idea of yourself like go and help someone and see how you feel about yourself afterwards because isn't that it right like I feel really good about myself today because 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 I'm helping people. And the way I look at myself is everything. I mean, you could strip me of everything I have right now. You could give, you know, naked, be on the street, my, my wife dead. And I would like feel really good because I I like 
I honor myself and I respect myself and respect. It's all about respect. I mean, it, yeah. Yeah. So it's just good. try it. I would say, just go and try it and see how you feel about yourself. And then it'll start a good spiral. So this is going to be kind of a little bit of a weird question, but um, I think it's maybe easier to get at the answer, which is if you th if you think about the, you were speaking a little bit earlier to the orientation of pain. In other words, how you, how you come, how you orient yourself to pain, right. Has changed, you know, since before the accident to now. So let's say before the accident, just, it's a hypothetical, obviously, let's say before the accident, you hurt your arm, do it like pretty bad. What would you, how would you have oriented to that pain before the accident? What would you have done? Well, before the accident, it wouldn't have been that pleasurable pleasurable, so to speak, but, uh, to pain is something I embrace now. So you would probably, you would try to get rid of it somehow. You would, yeah, you would yeah, I'll see where you're going with this. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. You would ignore it. You would try to get through it as fast as possible. Something like that. Yeah. Heal it up as fast as possible. Yes. So now you would embrace it, but would, would that mean like looking at it admirably? I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, what is, what is it? What does that I, mean? Like, how do you embrace it? I think, I think for the ones of us that have, ex have experienced deep pain, mental or physical, um, and gotten through it and gotten stronger by it, we now thrive on it. Cause as you said, the deeper the pain, the, the greater the joy like that, that, uh, duopoly, so to speak. So I, I mean, I've, I look for it every day. I work out two hours a day, once one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon. That's the physical pain, the mental pain I get every day when I wake up and I see my paralyzed wife. So people, so I'm a happy guy, right? And I've always happy before the accident and I'm, I'm happier now. And that, that helps me for sure. Um, in embracing the life we have now where I get to experience like death every day. Like I get to experience my wife's dreams being crushed and taken away every day when I see her because she's paralyzed neck down. I mean, when you're paralyzed neck down, you can't do much. That's you need help with everything. And I get to experience all that every day. So you can imagine it, it, the amount of strength it takes to get through that. Uh, and not forcefully, but so you have to like accept it. Like you really have to accept it. This is my life. And then you can sort of breathe and get through it. And that feeds you, so to speak. So if my wife dies and I think she will die before me, if, you know, if that's just how it is, then I'll, I'll probably seek out someone else to help because, because it, it gives me so much, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, it's, it's beautiful actually, because, um, a couple of things that I hear you saying is, um, one is you said, it's not forceful. It's this very monotonous day in day out and all of the little things, um, just like a workout, right? I work out, I lift weights myself as well. And it's little by little, you're strengthening that muscle. It's nothing fancy. It's not like, you do one bicep curl and like, that was the one pop. You know? <laughs> there it is. You know? That's the laughter. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> it's, it's not it's, exactly. <laughs> that's not how it works. It's the grind. Like you don't see yeah. results from this right away. But then on the other side of it, what you're saying is through that grind of looking at the pain and embracing it day in, day out, you're doing the things that you need to do anyway it's almost like you developed a superhuman strength. You were like above life in a sense. Um, and I don't mean that you're superior to life, but when you can face death and no longer be that afraid, all of a sudden, like what can life throw at you that will knock you down, that will deter you, that will scare you, that will any of that stuff. You now can do almost anything that you want to do. And I don't mean like you could be in the NBA and you're like <laughs> five foot four. I don't mean that kind of garbage. <laughs> But it's like you can face anything. You can do anything you put your mind to because you're no longer afraid. Yeah. No, you, you, you're you beautiful. I mean, that's – and that's how I feel, Aaron. I feel like um, – I have a, a Native American expression. I got a T-shirt from my CrossFit trainers that says, hookah hey, loosely translated, um, live so well that you die with a smile. So – and that's um, that's how I feel. And that, yeah. Yeah, Boom. that's, that's <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Boom. Yeah. I, yeah. it, it's like for you, pain has become an opportunity for growth and the experience of growth at the same time. Yeah. 
that, that makes and you, sense. And you see this, sorry for interrupting, but you see this at the extremes with people like David Goggins, with, which I'm sure mm -hmm. you heard of, which is yeah. just a, um, sold the more books than anyone else independently. And he's just gone taking it to the to the way extreme. But it's it's I also think it's his way of surviving. I always think if he stopped, he would die. Like that's that's how he manages it now, right? That's how he He literally can't stop running. Right. Literally. Exactly. He needs to do something. He, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I guess it's an addiction in one way or another, but we're all addicted to something. Like we all need some sort of, I guess, I guess it's a crutch, but it's a really good crutch, the pain yeah. and the suffering. Yeah. So just to kind of connect the dots here um, and, and to complete the evolution, you know, you, you talked about the beginning of the show and of your life being having all this stuff, all the external things that we here in America would say, like, these are the goals and the dreams that everybody would want to have, you know, you've got the girl, you've got the car, the Rolex, the money, you you got the body, right? Um, some of the fame, you know, being a, a known photographer. Um, and like, what does that stuff mean to you now? Like that, that didn't give you happiness, right? And so here you are, you go through this horrible accident, and you're saying now that you're a happy guy, like looking back now on the other side of this pain um, or this horrific accident, what does that stuff mean to you now? And what's really important to you now that gives you happiness and joy? Yeah, good question. You guys, you guys. Yeah, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Um, I drive an old beat up Jeep. I have, I don't have a Rolex anymore and I couldn't care less. Um, the only thing that matters to me now is our connections like connections with people, human beings. And I, I'm, I'm, I take great pride in connecting with people. And it may be on messenger on text in the morning, but I, I message and text the ones that I love the most every morning, every morning, just to check in because that's what I needed. Right. That's mm -hmm. what I asked for. So I want to be there for the people that, that I know need, need it. They need to hear it. So I text them. And then when I meet people, I, turn my fucking phone off like i just I, I don't look at it just take it away and i try to just be present be there with them and it's not hard like it's fantastic when you spend time with people you love and they accept you as you are and you accept them as they are and you laugh just like we're doing now dedicated time just to to converse it's fantastic it's beautiful so yeah connections with human beings I love that. It, I think especially because, you know, for you and the people that are listening, and this is true of my own life as well. This is, I think, why I do what I do as a therapist and even with people, which is why I think, you know, talking with you, Pavel, really excites me because it's taking this, taking pain that you've experienced that could be the thing that destroys you. Yeah. Um, but instead, you find a way to give that pain a purpose. Yeah. And your purpose now with that pain is like, oh, other people that might be in pain or other yeah. people that might be hurting or lonely and not have anybody. You're like, I know what that feels like. And it was horrible. And I don't want other people to feel that way. Yeah. Or I want to give people the gift that I got from the people that reached out to me. And I want to be that for them. And yeah. so then if there's this connection between this pain that you experienced that was so deep that also now can bring you so much meaning and purpose in your life. Yeah, I think, yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. You see, well, so I think when you go through something this big and you're this close to death, you get sort of a superpower. You get to see through people a little bit. You can, when you meet someone new and you can sort of see them differently. You see the layer, you can scale back the layers pretty fast. Right. Uh, and you can see them for who they are because you, um, you judge their behavior, I think and not what they're talking about. And their behavior says everything about people. You've learned that the mouth is not that important. It's what you actually do that matters. Um, so, um, so yes, sorry, I forgot what you were to say. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. <laughs> no, you definitely learned that. That's what I, I'm still struck by the whole transition with the family scenario in the very beginning, because there was, they were willing to talk to you, uh, yeah. meaning like say stuff, give money. Um, and that's it. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm playing with a thought here that part of the deal with pain is, is that it's, it's better understood inside of human connection. Um, it's processed that way. I don't like, if you're just alone and in pain, what's the point? I right. mean, you're just stuck and you're screwed essentially. And it's yeah. pointless. Right. <clears throat> and so yeah. go ahead, Sam. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add that six years after the accident, my mom emailed me and said, it was the biggest mistake of my life not coming over. And obviously I, I forg for, forgave her and I'd forgiven her way past then in my mind. But um, but yeah, see the, how, that's how it goes. But so the sad part in that is that she just, you know, she ruined it. Like she ruined those six years and it's ruined now too. Because even if you forgive someone and this is a different part topic, and, and I have, I don't call any grudges, but it's still very, very hard to move past it. Because you, in order for, for example, me and my mom to move past it, we would have to experience all the stuff I've gone through for six years. Because otherwise, what are we going to do? Talk about the weather? It's like, there's there's all these, so that when you go through all these obstacles and the suffering, the pain with people that, that bond you together and you became a warrior, but people that, people that choose not to go through it with you, it's very hard to connect with them again. I mean, I, I'll connect with her and I'll talk to her, but there's no depth. There's just no depth anymore. So, you know, it, thank you for sharing that actually, because I think that connects also something that we talked about earlier, which is the people that uh, like for your mom, for example, part of what she missed out on was it, I'm thinking about, you know, the people that have somebody going through something, whether it's you've lost somebody or somebody's in an accident like you were, Pavel. And I'm thinking, OK, you have an opportunity to be with them, but you also have an opportunity to be with them through all of this stuff. Yeah. And it's not just like, a, oh, I regret reaching out to you. I regret um, not calling you or texting you or being there. It's that I missed out on this incredible opportunity to be in this life-changing experience with you that you can never go back to. You can never do it. I mean, once it's happened, it's done. It's over with. So yeah. like, I, you know, no offense to mom. It's not like she's a bad person or whatever, but like she can, you can forgive, you can repair, but your relationship will never be the same because she wasn't there with you. And I, so I, I think I, for those people listening, it's like, take this as an opportunity to have this incredible experience. I mean, sure, you can go to Disneyland and ride rides. You can go to Europe and check stuff out. But man, to be with somebody in the depth of their pain and and be the most important person in their life for that moment. Oh God, it, like what's better than that? I'm jumping of joy here. I'm just jumping of joy. And I'll, I'll, I'll cut this and use that as a promo for my documentary because that is exactly what it's about. It's, I was I was giving people the opportunity to be a hero. And I write this in my book, and I, I it's one of the theses in the documentary too. Look here, I got this opportunity for you here. Help someone, be a hero, get the accolades. You know, it's, the, it's a classical hero's journey. So, but there's a distinction then when people who choose what they choose, so to speak. But yeah, I I couldn't have said it better. It's beautifully said, and it's, it's really everything I stand for right now is giving people the opportunity to be a hero. By doing, nothing, that opportunity. by doing nothing spectacular, just being with you. <laughs> right. It doesn't take anything else. That's it. Yeah. That's all it takes. And you will get accolades for yourself from others and gain respect and have self-respect and stop doubting yourself. And, you know, and, and those are the people that are closest to you or that that you love the most because they're in a place in your heart and a time in your life when you really yeah. needed them. Yeah. Yeah. That's special. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This was good. Well, this yeah. is, this, I feel much better now. This is a good talk. Yeah, well, I, I'm glad you're, I'm, I'm glad who you are and your message has been able to, had, to come out. I mean, it's, you, you, you know yourself well, you communicate your message really well. So I'm really grateful that we could have you on um, and people could see this because I think this is a fantastic message for this world to hear. Um, let's talk a little bit about your um, documentary. Tell us sure. a little bit about like, like, how did this even come about? Um what is it? When does it come out? Where do we find it? Yeah, give us all the details. Spill the tea. Yeah. It, um, so obviously, it, it, it the first three, four, five, the th I want to say the first three, four years after the accident was devoted to Cat, And I had to be 100% devoted to, well, to myself to be strong enough to help her and, and be with her. So I neglected, I let's say this, I neglected all the people that helped us. Not that I I wasn't mean or anything, but I just had nothing to give to them. All, all I did, all, all I did was take, 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 give, 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 give. And so now it's hmm. when I'm in a better place, I finally had the time, the finances, the, the everything to write a love letter to all my heroes. So the documentary I made is basically a love letter to hmm. everyone that helped us. And I try to try to portray their stories and where they're from in short little segments to get an idea of 
what kind of people helped us and why did they help us? Hmm. And, well, you can see it, but many people have gone through a lot of deep stuff. It may be abuse, it may be uh, rape, it may be maybe this, it may be that. Um, many of them are actually believers. I'm not a believer myself, but it, and and no judgment whatsoever, but many of them actually are believers. So that's also interesting that people that, I want to put a positive spin on it because it sounded bad. It's interesting that people that believe in something bigger than themselves came to help because they didn't all believe in God. We have a Native American uh, woman named Che who believed in um, this the the creator of all things, which could be anything, right? And we have this Dr. Fair and the neurosurgeon who literally believe in a God. And we have other people who believe in other bigger entities, but they believe in something bigger than themselves. And I think that's key that you don't do stuff just for you. You feel like you're part of something bigger, like you're part of, we're all one, right? We're stardust. And and those, those are the people that came and helped. So. Well, that sounds amazing. Um, wh where can we find this documentary? And like, when is it? Is it out right now? How do we watch it? Is it is not. It's premiering March 4th in, here in Los Angeles in a theater. Um, everything that I do is on truelovethebook.com, truelovethebook.com. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, this is fun though. Wow, what, how exciting. So I uh, do, you, um, I guess what I'm wondering, so it sounds like you communicate with with people somehow, I mean, do you do that through the truelovethebook.com or how does that good, work? Good, good question. So um, I wrote a book that was um, became a bestseller on Amazon. After that, I did a documentary, which is premiering now. During this year, um, we've also written a screenplay based on the book. So we, what we're doing now, we're, we're going to go on a funding round and fund fund a screenplay so we can do a feature film that we hopefully we see on Netflix in, in a year or two um, based on, on our story. And it's a story about love hope and resilience which which you obviously know mm -hmm. i'm also thinking about starting a podcast named the caregiver so hopefully i'll do that we'll see all right that's pretty cool well aaron you have anything else no i just want to say pavel thank you for uh for being on our show and um taking you know it's not lost on me that um as we talked about people giving of themselves and of their time as the most valuable resource that we have, that you've done that for us and for our audience. And I'm just thrilled that you came on here that, that we can continue also on the other side to promote that. I mean, it's a beautiful message. Um, you're an incredible person, not just for um, what you've done, but just the simplicity and beauty, I think, of your message of like, connect with people, be with people. I think the world needs more of that. So um, I'm grateful that, that you were on our show. So thank you for being here. Yeah, I, thank you so much. And I, yep, sorry. I'm just going to say I can't, couldn't have um, done it better. Do you want to say anything else, Pavel? No, I just I really appreciate the opportunity to be on our show. I really do. You guys are are, are fun, um, and yeah, I think you convey the message in a in a way that need that it needs to be conveyed in a in a sort of easy to go fun way, so people can take take the message because it's it's a tough message. And I've I listened to the other podcasts, and it's you're you're handling tough subjects in, in a very lighthearted manner which is some ways sometimes needed to, 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 to take it in, so to speak. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for being here. And for all of you out there, be a heroic human and have a great day. <clears throat>